So, this one? Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and giving the opportunity to present our data in a little different perspective, maybe, and also some very preliminary data and some studies which are just on their way. So, here, my disclosures. So TMS means <clears throat> transcranial magnetic stimulation, and the N is for navigated, which is kind of the new thing. Um, so what TMS means is that we have this uh, stimulation coil here um, with these navigation markers, and uh, this coil induces a magnetic field. And this magnetic field penetrates the skull, uh, and where it hits the brain, it induces an electric field, which then stimulates or inhibits neurons, or depolarizes neurons. And this uh, field, since we use a figure of eight coil, is extremely focal. Um, as you see here, in the, as I marked it in red. Um, and with the navigation, you can then really, with a high precision, see where you stimulate. And we have different responses to TMS. We have uh, EMG responses, um, so we use it um, to induce a MEPs, and when you have um, MEP or EMG electrodes on your extremities, um, you can then see the um, you know, different channels on the electrodes, which muscle you activate, and here you have the visualization of the device, and then you see very, with high accuracy, which part of the gyrus you stimulate and then you can make a map of the brain for motor function. We also have different answers uh, on TMS, which is MEG, uh, EEG, so you can do a TMS EEG, uh, and we have different behavioral um, effects we can induce. You can actually treat depression, you can treat pain, or chronic pain, and you can induce not only aphasia, but any kind of uh, disturbance of cortical function. So those two are those we use uh, as neurosurgeons for pre-surgical mapping. And we did this uh, since a lot of years, and not only us, but also other groups. And the first question was, how accurate is it? And the final answer was, it's about six millimeters, which is actually the, the, com the, the sum of all the components used in the system, and also in the interrupt navigation system, to also measure your direct cortical stimulation. So for motor function um, and plasticity, we also did some studies. Uh, and the first thing for you maybe is uh, what you ask yourself, how can we use this data uh, clinically? So this is just a quick example how we use TMS actually in our daily routine. Um, so this is a recurrent GBM uh, in the presandal gyrus. This on the right side, you see the PET MRI scan. And here you see the MRI with contrast. Um, and we did the TMS mapping of the patient, and uh, you see here the tumor in uh, red, and in blue and uh, green you see the motor maps, so the regions on the present gyrus where we're able to elicit any kind of MEP. In yellow you see the underlying corticospinal tract originating from the green areas. So. We operated, so we talked to the patient and said, yeah, we know, we know from the mapping that there is no MEP, and by experience, this is then true. Um, and we did the surgery. Um, actually, this was uh, a case of my chairman, and now he just checks the navigation. He doesn't do any DCS in such cases. I, in such case, I still would do it. Um, but it works quite well. So this is just uh, an example of the clinical use. So the other question was, of course, over the years, because we were also asked, since we do it non-invasively, and it would be great since we all now know that uh, tumors, and especially gliomas, can induce plastic reorganization, are you then able, without surgery, to detect functional reorganization? So um, it is known there is a quite old study from Theodor Kombos, uh, then his time in Berlin, where he measured uh, the, where he can elicit MEPs, and it was very, very frontal, also parietal, what most of you know, I think. Um, but what we found in this study is, uh, with our TMS data, that we kind of find the same when we overlay and normalize 100 patients with gliomas. 
So it's kind of comparable. The other thing is we compare different tumor groups. So depending on the tumor location, just as a quick overview, we see different patterns. So uh, this is, for instance, two patients with tumors in presental gyrus on the upper left and the upper right. You see patients with tumors anterior of the Rolandic region. Here's a post-central tumor. Uh, this is parietal, and this is actually a temporal tumor. So the pattern changes a little depending on the tumor location. But this was only a picture of all patients pre-op, so only one moment. Um, we also found um, that we, want, we wanted to find out which uh, MEPs were elicited which are longer uh, than regular MEPs. So maybe MEPs which are um, transported over more than one synapse. And we defined it as having... Uh, being, uh, the, having a latency which is longer than one standard deviation above the mean. And we found in the superior frontal gyrus and in the medial frontal gyrus uh, actually more MEPs uh, having longer latencies. And in these spots, we also elicited interop mes uh, measurements in interop MEPs, and we always found in these very anterior regions also MEPs with short latencies um, and with uh, only little stimulation and high MEP amplitudes. So the other question was, since we found these spots, because we were asked, well, but this might not be an eloquent spot. So we then did a study in which we, because from the beginning of our TMS program, when a lot of the surgeons didn't really believe in the data or didn't use it, um, we, we figured out some tumors which were, re which were resected anterior of the presental gyrus, um, and we just realized if there were TMS positive points which got resected, which are not in the Rolandic region. So, and what we found is, of course, this is kind of, you can discuss if you do such a thing, but this retrospectively, so we didn't do it on purpose, but we analyzed it on purpose. And what we found is, on the left side, you see TMS Patient, uh, TMS points resected. On the other side, you find patients who did not undergo resection of TMS positive points. Um, and what you see here in dark is the number of permanent deficits, which is extremely high. So eight out of 13 patients who had a MEP positive point resected anterior of the presental gyrus had a permanent worsening of their motor function. So it's not plegic, but it's permanent worsening of their motor function. It's not a fine motor function deficit, it's actual real paresis. And so, the, is, it, can I show you here the screenshots of some patients? And the exclusion criteria in the study was that they had no ischemia on a post-op scan. And when we look at the MEP latencies, we found here, the, you find a group here on the left with no paresis, trans and permanent on the left, and we only found a difference to the patients between the resected and non-resected points, um, that the, the tail latency was actually longer in those patients who had resected TMS points. So they were longer in a mean of almost three milliseconds, but actually they were still causing a deficit when we resected them. And we still don't know what all this data means completely. The other question was, of course, what um, are we able to detect the functional change, or a change of function over time? So we did one study, uh, which, is, which was actually the first pilot study we did, uh, measuring 22 glioma patients on a longer follow-up twice. Um, so we did repeated TMS mappings, normalized the data, calculated the center of gravity, and also the hotspot of the MEP measurements. Um, and you see here in, in red, you see the first map, and in blue, the second. This is the center of gravity of each map, and you see quite a lot of differences. The left picture is um, patients with the tumor anterior of the motor area, and uh, on the right side, patients with tumor on the post posterior to the motor area. This is overall the change of shift of the center of gravity and uh, we found on the anterior posterior axis a sh mean shift of almost one centimeter in all these patients over time, and 
so they had between, um, was between 90 days and uh, nine months between both mappings. And if you analyze this by the tumor location, so posterior means, uh, white means anterior tumors, uh, so tumors anterior to the motor region, and the positive means to, for, from dorsal to frontal, um, we see that the hotspot and the center of gravity uh, both move towards a tumor in both groups, which is not what we want to, uh, actually. We also thought, well, there are so many things which could go wrong, and in all this normalization and fusion we did, we actually masked the tumor so, and its resection cavity, so we actually took care of any kind of distortion by having a tumor removed, so this is not an artifact we measured. But then I said, yeah, well, we should maybe have a long, higher cutoff than our calculated inaccuracy might be. So we took a cutoff value of one centimeter and said, yeah, but maybe analyze how many patients had a shift of the center of gravity and the hotspot of more than one centimeter. And this were 50% uh, of the patients, and it were the high grade and the low grade patients. So in terms of language, um, we also did some other studies, but I just focused this talk on motor and language now, um, since that's uh, most data we have right now. We did a study which was actually also done parallel in Berlin, which uh, who found the same results, so, um, which was quite fascinating. In, for team S mapping, you stimulate a spot of a patient, uh, a cortical spot, and the number of errors you elicit per number of stimulations is your error rate, so you don't induce any kind of language disturbance on any, every stimulation you do. So it's usually between 10 and 30% your error rate. And we said, well, we want to compare both hemispheres, so we compare to the subgyre of each hemisphere to each other by dividing the error rates of the left by the right hemisphere. So having a ratio which is higher than one means you have left dominance, at least in terms of this TMS mapping, and lower than one, uh, it means a right dominance. And here you find the different errors we elicited on the y -ax x-axis. On the y-axis you find the dominance ratio, and one means it's uh, kind of bilateral dominance. And you see in, uh, when, when you compare in white the patients with the volunteers in gray, you see that the patients have, more, have a lower dominance ratio, which means it goes more to the right than to the left, at least compared to the volunteers. In this picture, we presented graphically on the left uh, healthy volunteers, on the right patients, and uh, so the, the darker red it gets, the more um, left dominant it is, so the higher the dominance ratio is. And you see here quite easily how much more the patients show a dominance ratio, at least in TMS, um, towards the right side, actually. And since then, the, our colleagues from Berlin found the same, and on a lot of meetings we were asked, and we asked ourselves, well, if a patient then has maybe more language on its right side, does, uh, might, might be the, maybe the risk for inducing any kind of deficit might be less um, if we do surgery on the left side. So we put up this new study where we, with by, uh, our two centers, Charité and uh, TU, uh, enrolled 80 patients, which were all operated on awake. Um, and what we found is by also calculating our hemispheric dominance ratio, um, we, we asked if we see a difference in those patients who got, had a deficit afterwards and who had not. Um, the good result was that we, or it was actually all as we expected, but uh, we had out of 80 patients, three with a permanent new slight impairment, new impairment of language, which means we only have a very small group of permanent deficit, which is good for the patients, but uh, not good for the analysis, of course. Um, but we analyzed then the transient paris uh, aphasia, at least, and the aphasia on the fifth post-op day, and what we saw is that, again, this dominance ratio, as you see here, um, again, on the y-axis, is higher in those patients who had a deficit afterwards than those who had not. 
So it was actually true. So the conclusion to our uh, studies we did in the last seven years now on Team S and how we tried to find out um, how Team S could be of help, at least in some cases, um, we find that there is definite value in patients who have perisylvian or perirolandic tumors. Um, TMS and IOM are complementary methods. Uh, TMS should not replace IOM. Um, it both increases the safety of surgery, and in some cases, IOM starts with TMS. Um, also, your mapping, since for awake surgeries at least, it really can help to guide your starting point uh, for your awake mapping, for instance. Um, at least to our data, we think we might be able to detect cortical plasticity, uh, but since the subgroups, we, we are not able to, to analyze too many homogeneous subgroups since the, patients are, the patient numbers are too low. Um, we intend to include more patients um, in the next years. Um, so coming to therapy, which I think a lot of you are also very interested in, um, this is something we just start. So what we know from stroke patients, um, there is uh, data that you can do, patients even with chronic stroke, you can do contralateral inhibitory TMS to the healthy hemispheres since um, it is known that the injured ischemic hemisphere even gets inhibited by the healthy one. So you do inhibitory TMS not uh, to, the, to the healthy hemisphere and during your rehab. And actually this is an overview uh, study um, and you see how many studies are, have been done on stroke patients with a lot of different protocols who showed uh, actually quite good effects. So my idea was, or not only mine, um, maybe do this uh, in our patients who suffer from any kind of ischemia in the motor system during surgery. Um, so we started a study now some time ago um, of patients who wake up and have a paresis and show a uh, ischemia in post-op diffusion images. What we do is that we do our motor test, of course, and then we do a motor mapping on the first post-op day, and then they get uh, randomization, actually, and we start treatment while they are on the ward uh, for seven days uh, with contralateral inhibitory TMS. Um, right now, we calculate the number from the Contrastim study, um, and our current status, so it's still blinded, um, but we see, at least in patients you have on the ward, we see a much quicker recovery in some patients than I expected by experience in last year, so I can still tell you any kind of result, but... Um, Fortunately, since we started the study, we almost had no patients with any deficit, which is, of course, good, but which makes the study slow. Um, and we right now, last month, we got UCSF as the third center to uh, start enrolling. Now we have uh, nine patients, which might take a while. Um, the second project um, is such patients here, if about which we talk quite a lot already, but in whom we can see during a, at least the TMS mapping or maybe during surgery already who have maybe here language function still and have tumor remnant. Um, or here in the PET scan, you see here a language function still in the PET spot. Um, why not do prehabilitation on these patients, which means doing inhibitory TMS there and try to change the network? Um, and there is actually an invasive study, as most of you know, know I think, with five patients, uh, which was done uh, actually here in Spain. Um, the patients who had about up to 37 days of uh, internal grid electrodes and stimulation, um, but unfortunately with a high complication rate, but uh, it was actually possible to then move the function in all these patients. So thinking about how TMS could help, um, there's only one case report um, which went over uh, 12 days, 
And what the investigators found was that the language function worsened after each session, which is by experience true when you do to one spot quite a lot of stimulations. You see this, that your function gets worse, but it recovers very quickly. Um, and, but this effect got better and better, so it didn't worsen when they stimulated the spot where they wanted to remove the function from uh, over time. So it didn't occur, the function got worse. Um, which was regarded as a uh, function reorganization. So I'm still looking for a patient uh, in our department, um, but this is one project which should be worth focusing on. The final conclusion, uh, I hope you all also think that we didn't fall in the kind of the hammer and nail trap with TMS. Um, if so, please tell me. Um, However, I think we got a very good idea where we might be able to improve some of the approaches or might make some of the follow-ups quicker or the surgeries easier. Um, it's easy to apply the TMS protocol and also the, all, all the standards you need very easily in the department. Um, and we were able to show that we can see changes in functional anatomy. Um, the therapeutic applications, at least in the researchery, are at the beginning, um, but I think they have a huge potential and it's worth uh, focusing on these. Um, and during the years of TMS, we found now a really nice study group um, who has a common interest on improving uh, what we're doing. So since five years, we have an international collaboration which are these three centers, and we started with even more centers. And in the last years, we now had like seven shared publications, uh, which also speaks for the productivity of the group. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also started a trial, which already has now 100 patients enrolled, uh, where we do TMS motor mapping, randomized, so there are patients without and patients with motor mapping, and we see what the impact is. So it's, it's not only about the surgery itself and the interrupt mapping and the use of interrupt mapping, it's also about um, the indication and the rate of biopsies or the conversion between biopsies and surgery and so on. So since seven months, we were able to enroll 100 patients and I hope we um, are quite fast with acquiring the last 240. So, all the data presented was not myself only. I have a big group in Munich and also a lot of international collaborators, which is always a lot of fun. Um, and I'm eager to any questions later on if you're interested. Thank you very much.